everybody. I'd like to call to order the 2017 Illinois Budget Impacts from State Decisions Work Session. And I'd like to start with the introduction and we'll start on this day. Suzanne Blue-Green, Mayor's Office. Mike Abbott, Municipal Manager. Ethan Berkowitz, Mayor. Lance Wilbur, Office of Management and Budget. Bill Evans, Summer. Two trainers, Southwest. Elvin Gray Jackson. Ford Spudbar. Tim Steele. And in the audience? Uh, Zach Hughes. Debbie Kelly, Median. Mr. And I'm on the phone, just FYI. Sorry, Mr. Bosky. Mr. Bosky. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I just wanted to give the assembly a snapshot of the situation um, in regards to the municipality's budget on uh, account of state decisions. And I want to preface my comments by noting that historically people in Anchorage have received a combination of services from the meshing of the state fiscal system and the municipal, the municipal municipality's fiscal system. The, the state system is clearly broken and dysfunctional. And what's happened is that the state is shifting cost to Anchorage as well as devolving responsibilities in our direction. And uh, I wanted to explain the, the magnitude of what the, those, those cost shiftings have been. Next slide. So the first and most obvious one is a decline in municipal assistance and revenue sharing. And this slide here gives us the past five years of municipal assistance and revenue sharing. If you go back to municipal assistance and revenue sharing, um, it's been as high as 25 or $30 million. We're projecting it to be $4 million, uh, $4.4 million next year. That's a significant decline from the 2016 budget. And, uh, Municipal assistance and revenue sharing is the state's way of sharing the, the wealth of Alaska with all the local governments. And this, it, it, from my perspective and my understanding what, what it is, it's a retreat from a historic promise that was made that local governments would be would, uh, share the oil wealth of the state. Uh, and this is the first instance and most obvious instance of how that decline has affected us. But, but note that we've seen a significant loss in revenue sharing over the last few years. Next slide, please. Now, this is the state, it also hands out a permanent fund dividend. I'm sure people in this room are aware of that. Um, what they might be less aware of is that much of, many of those dividends are garnished for various purposes. And the municipality has garnished some of these dividends for the purpose of collecting fines and, and uh, other debts that are owed to the municipality from various individuals. Um, over the last year, the, the amount of revenue that we could collect from that, uh, from PFD uh, has declined. It went from 4.4 million down to 2.6, and we're projecting even less in the 2017 budget. I believe it ordered range to $1.5 million, $1.7 million. So that's another uh, loss of more than a million dollars of revenue based on the state's actions. Uh, next slide, please. MLMP, which is which is a municipally owned utility, has historically generated a dividend. Um, order of magnitude of that dividend in the past was seven million dollars. The, the state, through the Regulatory Commission of Alaska, stripped us of our ability to collect that dividend. Um, and they did that in 2016. We projected that we would have had a dividend in the order of magnitude of $8 million. They're projecting to do it again this upcoming year. I mean, uh, some might say the $8 million, but I put out there that the, the municipality just helped MLMP acquire a gas field for uh, our share would be about $100 million worth of that. And, if we were to get a 5% return on our investment, that might be four or five million, five million dollars worth of additional return. So the, the impact of not allowing us to collect a dividend for a property or that we have is significant. 
Yes. Well, well uh, you, you seem to be moving along in a good clip, so if you want me to hold it till the end, I can. But I do have a sort of question about this specifically. That's all right. Come on, let's it's, it's more sort of directed at Bill, um, perhaps, about the legal case here. So um, could you sort of refresh for me exactly what the legal issue is here? And perhaps Mr. Mayor or, or, or Mr. Falsky, if you'd be willing to sort of you know, recklessly speculate uh, on the chances that we are able to get this again. And through the chair, the Regulatory Commission of Alaska has been empowered by the state legislature through a state statute to enjoin the payment of a dividend distribution to the municipality if they believe the capital structure of the utility is impaired or, more ambiguously, may become impaired. And the RCA found that the MLP capital structure, which is in the high 30s, I believe, is not impaired but may become impaired. And so they then join the payment of a dividend. We do not agree with that analysis. And we are taking a hard look at what steps we can take to come back to the RCA to persuade them that MLP structure is not actually impaired or likely to become impaired in the near future. There's a couple of salient facts that I'd look at there. First of all, they did not include the gas assets that we have. Secondly, there's a difference between different kinds of debt, if it's a high interest rate of debt or a lower interest rate of debt. Uh, and the third thing is they, when you compare how they treated MLP differently from other utilities, they held us to a much higher standard. And we, we feel that those issues are significant. One of the other ways that the state has held us to a different standard, even though we've enjoyed the benefit of owning at least a third of the Little River for some period of time, um, we were not allowed to collect tax credits that were extended to the, the private sector. Um, and uh, our estimation is that the almost seven million dollars worth of tax credits that were paid out to the private sector but not to the municipality and we think that kind of discriminatory um, yeah, by the state by the state uh, is inappropriate next slide please so and we have to look at the cost shifting that's occurred in public safety and this is a partial list and I say it's a partial list because there's a there's there's hard to quantify items that aren't included we just got a, a, a lovely letter from the Department of Corrections saying that they're going to increase our fees for use of the Anchorage Jail by approximately a million dollars a year. Uh, they wanted to do it effective October 1st. Um, we think that this is inappropriate for them to do. And I say it's inappropriate for them to do because some of the conditions of our contract say that if there's been a significant change in the criminal justice statutes, uh, which, could, which would result in a in a different rate of incarceration, we would revisit the contract. Senate Bill 91 would constitute one of those distinctions. Um, I'd also note that there's a lot of uncompensated APD um, assistance with state charges. When officers show up in court to testify, for example, we're not paid for that. Uh, there's, there's other items that we're not paid for. Uh, and I would note that Fairbanks has taken a very uh, different tack than we have. Fairbanks charges only under state charges, meaning that anyone who's incarcerated in Fairbanks has done so on a state charge. Therefore, Fairbanks does not pay to incarcerate anybody. And so if the municipality of Anchorage were to take such an extreme measure, we could save $2 million a year. I, I don't, I'm not recommending that at this point. Um, but I'm just noting that there are options that we can entertain that would change the dynamic of how it works. Mr. Training has a question, but before he does a question, I'd like to, um, for the record, recognize that Mr. Weddleton has joined us. Mr. Training. Since so they've changed the whole penal code, my question relates to halfway homes. It says the state is now accruing a lot more people on halfway homes. There's nothing else than to do a drop in. They walk in the front door, they walk out the back door. It becomes our problem. Is there any cost we can give to the state to pick up the cost? Well, as a cost to our officers, money and time. As a note, um, uh, Mr. Traney, that the last uh, bullet point on this slide is that we're reapprehending the escapees from the Department of Corrections. And uh, most of those people are incarcerated because APD apprehended them and put them in jail. And when they escape, we have to go out and catch them again. And, put them in jail again, but it also contributes to uh, a threat to public safety. So we're in the process of quantifying what those costs are. Um, 
perhaps in the we might be in a position where we can bill the state for um, serving as as their wardens, uh, but it is something for us to, to look at. You know, Senate Bill 91, which I referenced too, there were some unintentional impacts uh, of it, and I say they're unintentional because the legislators were completely unaware of this, but the amount of fines that we're able to collect based on our traffic code being different than their traffic code is going to have an impact on the municipal budget in excess of $400,000 a year. I mean, they, they have different uh, elements than we do, and, and they have different uh, different fine schedule. So that's one of those unintended impacts where their decision impacts us. And then there's the obvious one where this, the, where uh, Girdwood lost a trooper post, and we're having to backfill that. And uh, Girdwood is, is going to tax itself to the tune of $600,000 a year because the state has retreated from what had historically been one of its responsibilities. And, and I, I would note that the rest of the arm is, is not attended to yet, and it's something we are, are very much aware of. Next slide, please. So some of the other additional costs and reductions in revenue, um, uh, state overreach, you might call it, in some instances, look at the snowplow responsibility. Department of Transportation has indicated that they're going to lay people off. They've gotten rid of equipment in the bowl area, and uh, it's going to wind up resulting from, the, given the interplay between state and municipal roads, it's going to result in an additional burden for our plows and our crews uh, to, to keep the roads clear, and we estimate that it's going to cost about million dollars in, in excess cost. Um, I, I'd also know, and this is again one of these frustrating things, is that they want to charge us for a snow dump, um, which we use, we acknowledge that we use it, but we also let them use our snow dumps, and there's been sort of a nice barter exchange that's going on, uh, and that's going to be a $250,000 increase, roughly. Um, some of the other items that exist, is in, in the Budget Advisory Commission brought it to our attention, I think many of you all were aware of it, is that there's a mandatory um, property tax exemption for buildings with sprinklers. That costs the taxpayers of Anchorage $815,000 a year. And it's a, it's a state mandate, even though we have it as a regulatory matter that we require certain buildings to have sprinklers. So that's the kind of state overreach. There's, the railroad, in a desperate attempt to increase its revenue, is increasing its its leases um, by at least $100,000, which is about a 50% increase over what it's been historically. There's, there's The state has backed away from its match, its commitment to match on domestic violence and sexual assault, and that cost us $400,000. There's hidden costs that exist because of uh, of the state's uncertainty. I mean, one, there was a Nixle yesterday, we're going to see a lot of these, about an accident on the Glen Highway. Well, a lot of these accidents are attributable to the fact that there's running on those roads, and, um, and people get caught in those ruts, they have accidents, and that is not only a hardship for people impacted, but it, it creates additional cost uh, for Chugiak, for, um, for Eagle River, and for other first responders who are attending to those scenes. So that's an example of the hidden cost, and there's a lot of them when we start to look around. And the, the, the property taxpayers of Anchorage are the ones who bear those burdens. The, the other burden gets paid because how the state is responding to its fiscal crisis is unpredictable. It's uncertain, it's capricious, it's sudden, and it's very difficult to plan. And for that contingency. And you, we've heard members of the private sector talk about how difficult it is to make investments under a circumstance where you don't know what the state is going to do next. It has a, a similar impact on the municipality. If we know what they're going to do, if we know the direction that they intend to go, we can plan. If we can participate in uh, their solutions, then Anchorage is, is better protected. Let's get the last slide, please. So the aggregate rough cost, the rough estimate of the red ink that the state is costing Anchorage this year alone 
is in excess of $24 million. That is a significant sum. That's roughly 5% of our budget. And we can accommodate some of these costs, but it represents a structural change in the, the relationship between the state and the municipality. And because of that, I wanted to make sure that the assembly was aware of this structural difference um, and, and hopefully can give some thought to how we can <coughs> accommodate it, not just this year, but into the future. Because these structural changes are going to necessitate a reevaluation of how we conduct ourselves, particularly in relationship with state responsibilities. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Training? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, because we need to make sure folks understand what we're dealing with. Because this budget, you and I have attended meetings in Anchorage. Everybody says we want more public safety. But that has a cost with it. If we put this budget together, it's going to be really hard to figure out where to get the money from to cut our services because of the state. One thing you should add here, added cost for just revenue, is the complete abrogation of the state's responsibility to pay the senior citizen public tax exemption. When that was passed, the state said, we're reimbursing for getting it. They don't. They give it every year to seniors. The state's walked away from the responsibility. Uh, approximately 25% of the properties in Anchorage are untaxed, which means that the other 75% of the property taxpayers are subsidizing those 25%. Mr. Mayor, is there anything we can do to start taxing what was left from the old uh, bridge to nowhere as the state was taking property in the Government Hill area and was going off our tax rolls? Since they're not going to build that bridge to nowhere, is it possible for us to put that back on our tax rolls? Um, well, if it's a state owned property, I'm going to butcher this, uh, Councilor, but there's one of the first Supreme Court cases was McCulloch v. Maryland, and it basically said that the power to tax is the power to destroy, and, a, and, a, and you couldn't. A subsidiary level of government couldn't tax a superior level of government. Did they get that right? I, I looked at all the lawyers over there. I don't get to use McCulloch and Maryland very often. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. And they're not going to use the property for that purpose. No, but you know, the state ought to think about payments in lieu of taxes because they took something off the tax rolls. And when they take something off the tax rolls, that means everybody else is subsidized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Training. Mr. Flynn? I've got a series, Madam Chair, so I'm willing to wait until the most of the staff's neighbors have asked you to perform for me for a while. No, I don't. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Mr. Flynn. 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 Thank you, Mr.
in recent years, they've had eight people dedicated to plowing the pedestrian facilities. I believe they're going to two um, in their plan for the 16-17 winter. So a lot of the extra work on state rights of way that we're picking up is related to uh, pedestrians and cyclists. Yeah, I, uh, I guess my probably would be go more appropriately after Mr. Flint, but, but I'll just say it now. Uh, you know, I'm usually pretty good about asking a question, but this time I just kind of want to make a, a comment. Uh, and Mr. Mayor, thank you for this for this presentation. I think it lays things out pretty well. Um, and you know, there, there's a finite amount of wealth in the state, and when we when we talk about shifting. Uh, uh, Cost from the state to the muni. I don't want us to get it uh, stuck in this kind of us versus them mindset. I'm not accusing you of doing that. I don't think you guys are doing that. Um, but the understanding that uh, you know, if, if Anchorage is paying, if Anchorage were to pay less, that means it's going to come out of some other uh, Alaskan's pocket in, in theory. Um, and, and, and I know, sort of growing up in, in rural Alaska, there's this, this view: it's, it's the rest of Alaska versus Anchorage, or it's the valley versus Anchorage, or the state versus Anchorage. And I don't want us to get in that mindset. However, that being said, I think you've done a good job of articulating that the reason this is happening is because the state legislature has ducked their responsibility to pass a fiscal plan. I mean, that, that really is what this boils down to. We are seeing a reverberations of a failure to act at the state level that is going to push additional costs and reduce revenues onto the city. And then we are going to get accused of being, you know, whether it's tax and spend or whatever it is, because the hard choices we are going to have to make because the state legislature has refused to make those those choices. So, um, unfortunately, I won't be able to be there on Monday um, when, when I believe you're discussing this with the legislature, but uh, I just wanted to, to say that now, and I apologize for the drive. Uh, you're fine. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. Mr. Steele. Yeah, um, particularly in the LP, uh, you know, I think it's important to understand that we could challenge this to RCA, or what the situation would be like. Well, we have a rate case in front of RCA right now, we're going to make our case to them, and we're going to pursue other channels as well to make sure that the municipality, which has an investment, can get a return on the municipality's investment. It seems logical to me, so uh, I'm sure it's I'm sure it is. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I hope we are going to do do that. The um, the other thing that just uh, drives me nuts is that. We're going to get blamed for the whole thing. We're trying to cut the costs. If it could, you know, part of the reason why, the, why this whole situation has devolved to the point that it's devolved is, is that uh, there are hard choices to be made. And when you talk to the public um, and make them aware of what those hard choices are, then don't pander and don't sugarcoat don't pass the blame, the public understands that these are hard choices. There will always be elements that, that don't and use whatever decisions are made for political purposes, and that's their right under our form of government. But for the most part, people of Anchorage are fair, and they understand that these are difficult choices, and that we, we've got to make them, and that ignoring them doesn't make the choices easier, and, it, and that the longer we ignore them, the more difficult and problematic the solutions become. The, the other problem that I see is in Department of Corrections where uh, the, the uh, governor's solution, uh, which is the, uh, um, you know, letting people out, basically, the halfway house issue, and uh, uh, so we're picking up more of the tab in terms of corrections, and I know there are people, uh, quote, quote, um, but it just seems to me that uh, to a certain extent, they're advocating their responsibility. Do we need to now build prisons and take more people uh, in in order to you know, save the cost, that will cost? You, you know, in a, a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, Anchorage has benefited from being uh, the, the, the financial capital of Alaska, from being a headquarter city, and we've been able to absorb a lot of the benefits of that. But there are also costs that come from being the lead city in the state. And some of those costs 
are attributable to the Department of Corrections releasing people into our community. A lot of the, the hubs or smaller communities don't have probation and parole offices. The plans of release for prisoners are non-existent or they will require them to check in with probation and parole. And so we wind up with some of those costs coming here, not just in terms of direct cost to our law enforcement, but also in terms of the, the cost to public safety and, uh, and frankly, lands in the homelessness arena as well. So these are all complex and interrelated situations, and um, the state needs to be more aware of its responsibility and stop retreating from it. One of those particular areas is they have done almost nothing, whereas in the past they used to do a significant amount more with drug drug and alcohol treatment. Um, and they've, they've retreated well, from that. we are having a little bit of a crime issue, or at least the perceived crime issue in the community that are good. It's going to end up costing us mm -hmm. some money to deal with. And, and I don't begrudge it. I guess it's our citizens getting jobs. But, uh, no, there's, I mean, there's, there's trade-offs in all of this, but, but we need to understand what the trade-offs are. And, there are costs as well as benefits. John, getting back to your uh, sprinkler system, the problem with that law the state passed was it never ends. You can put that building up five years later, you know, five years you're getting the sprinkler, 20 years you're getting the sprinkler discount, 30 years, it never ends. <laughs> we asked the state legislature to address that this year and they didn't. So we'll be asking this next year, address the issue because it needs to be something locally determined to win that hand. Thank you, Mr. Train. Mr. Clem, before you uh, call on you, can I just make a comment relative to what Mr. Train just said? So, in terms of the sprinkler system, the Mayor's right, the Budget Advisory Commission um, gave us some ideas on, on how to save some money. And there's a bill, I don't know if it's in the House or the Senate, to make uh, the sprinkler system extension an option. And um, just so everybody knows, there's a resolution coming before the Assembly um, supporting that making it an option, and we're, the reason why we're bringing forward a resolution is because Alaska Municipal League is going to be meeting here, and we're going to um, put that resolution in as a list of priorities in the municipal league, municipal league's position papers, and we got a, a, an approval from Mr. Evans, who happens to serve on the board. Um, of the last municipality, but I just want to let everybody know that we're moving we're forward and trying to do something about that, make it a worthwhile option, which would be really, really great. And then we can decide at this level how we want to handle it. Thank you. Mr. Flynn, you have, uh, yes, no, just kidding. <laughs> 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 I, just kidding. I only need 28 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, first off, on the decreased revenue sharing, I don't know if you want to fly back to the slide or not. Um, I'm just curious. Is the estimation based on what's currently in the municipal trust uh, the state did not replenish uh, plants? You know, that, what's the basis of the estimation? So the current legislation, the last legislation that they passed as it relates to how they would deal with revenue sharing next year, that's how this estimate was created. So because there was no appropriation to replenish it, this is our best guess as to what our percentage will be? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, looking forward to the public safety slide. Um, one of the things that we have done at the municipal level is uh, increase our jurisdiction over misdemeanor crime so that we are receiving the revenues derived therefrom. Um, and so we have this corrections increase in fine and fee production. And we've done a greater analysis looking into what we did like three years ago, Madam Chair, increase the number of things that we took on in the strength of the store here. We've done an overall analysis to what our what our net benefit is recent changes to state law versus what we did in the civil code. Don't you want to take that or 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm happy to take it if you want, though. So through the chair, the answer is we're beginning that process now. It is correct that we do not need to have a prosecutor's office, much like we do not need to have a police department in Anchorage, but we have taken on those functions. The individual prosecutor's office has been designed both to allow us to charge municipal misdemeanors and potentially reap different fines and fees, which we think are more effective. So, for instance, our traffic code has historically said the fine for a failure to wear a seatbelt, I don't remember the particular number, but I know the state fine is a pittance, it's something like $50 or something, and we thought that was inadequate deterrence, we wanted to be able to take that into our own hands. And the thinking was that taking that on at the local level gave us greater control and might actually pay off and may actually be a net revenue generator. I'm not, not sure that that is the case and we're taking a look at that. But the, the, the conversation has started because SB 91 significantly changes the game because SB 91 now says that fines and fees at the local level have to be capped at what's going on at the state level. So now it does become a question, is the local control enough for us to continue in those business lines? Do we want to continue to have local municipal code, which basically matches local or state traffic code, locally enforced by local prosecutors, or is that something we should say, if we're not allowed to tinker with the fines and fees, then that's maybe not a business line we want to be in anymore. Now I will say that uh, the benefit of the prosecutor's office extends beyond a simple financial measure, both because we have historically been able to tinker with the levels of fines and fees, but also because it allows us to get into different kinds of business lines. So for instance, we have at the local level a s criminal spice misdemeanor that does not exist in state law. If we did not have a prosecutor's office, there would be no one to prosecute criminal distribution of spice, for instance. But suffice to say, um, we don't have a cost benefit in hand, but we are beginning the conversation of thinking seriously about how our relationship with the state should work. And, uh, and partly also because we have some significant apprehension that as the state budget gets tighter, the state DAs are likely to say, increasingly, we are not interested in misdemeanors, and that should be a local function. So our workload could go up just because of state application of the field. If I could, let me just jump in here. You know, Alaskans, we love to chafe at uh, federal overreach and unfunded mandates because you know, it's embedded in the Alaska Constitution is that local governments are best positioned to deal with local issues. SB 91, in a lot of ways, usurped our ability to take care of our own issues. And I think much of this was done inadvertently. I think there's some policy calls that the legislature and the governor are entitled to make, but there was some intrusion into our authority to make sure that we're doing what's in the best interest of Anchorage. And that's one of the things that we need to make sure that we protect and we get corrected. Well, um, the legislative committee is meeting next week, so it would be worthwhile to get the recommendation as to how we might amend uh, the state statute to allow for some local control over some of the fees and fines that were capped uh, by that legislation. Um, but it would also be useful to see the analysis of what, what is our cost benefit and you know, recognizing that some of these prosecutions may fall to us in a, on an increased level as state resources are diminished. We know what we're buying. And so that, that analysis would be really helpful. Uh, and, 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 you know, you look at the history too, and the history was that we had a strong state government, strong central state government with the expectations that local governments would one day generate the wherewithal to take care of ourselves. And I think that's that was a good theory they had 50 years ago, plus when the when at statehood. Um, but as Anchorage has more capacity to deal with some of the responsibilities than other parts of Alaska do, we need to make sure that the legislature and the governor respect our ability <coughs> to look out after our own people. Yeah, well, that was obvious from a long time ago. Um, uh, flipping over to uh, added costs, reduced revenue. Uh, and I don't expect, despite the encyclopedic knowledge of our city manager, you'd be able to answer the question now. But it would be nice to see what roads are we taking responsibility for and uh, from the city. 
Yeah, it's a complicated deal and it sometimes even varies with the amount of snowfall. There, it's memorialized in a uh, transfer of responsibilities agreement, which we're actually rewriting right now in the form of a... And you uh, are familiar with my, my, my regular question. Yeah. And uh, the short answer is here, we are subsidizing them. That is the, the outcome of that. Let's, let, and I'll be glad to share the tour with you. It's, it has not yet been signed, but it is, uh, the, it's been agreed to at the staff level. Um, it's essentially working its way through both organizations right now for final, uh, final action. I, I would appreciate seeing it before it's signed. Uh, sure, it's in a draft. You can look at it. I appreciate that. Okay. I, I do want to say, you know, it's one of the things that's obvious it's not mentioned there because it's a school district item in focus, but is the, the veto of the bond debt and the, the retreat from the bond debt reimbursement. Uh, and to me, that is a, an incredibly problematic step that the state took. That's not the only thing. Um, and then, school district. Did, you mentioned specifically <coughs> that regarding uh, slow uh, snow uh, clearing that uh, pedestrian facilities were being treated from and transferred to us. Are we... They're not transferred to us. We can assume responsibility for it. Okay. They have not been, we have, they have not been transferred to They're us. They're trying to push them on us. Let's put it that way. Well, yeah, and it's not, we're not accepting the right-of-way. We're just accepting the maintenance responsibility over that. How much equipment is going to do that? No. They've sold their um, uh, sidewalks, the, the sidewalk snow plowing equipment that they have not needed, I believe they have already surplus that. We'll be using the equipment we already own to do that. It is, we're not, ex we're not accepting any additional equipment expense, except to the extent that we'll be using our equipment more, which is not nothing but we're not acquiring any equipment in order to do that. It is labor that is being, uh, 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 it is a labor expense that we will be incurring as a result of this. Before the Torah is signed, I would appreciate somebody revisiting with DOT whether that equipment could be transferred to the municipality if it hasn't actually already been surplused. Okay prior to the agreement. Okay. okay. Um, and then finally, the piece, last slide here, that um, is sort of missing to this discussion is we didn't come to the final agreement as to how we're going to use surplus tax revenues in the first quarter by the payments. And so, um, again, I don't expect an answer right now but we need to have some clarity as to how we're going to utilize those dollars to address the shortfall that we're seeing this year and how they might be applied in 2017. Uh, I, I'm sort of expected to see that in part because we just got the revenue report that showed the, the gap, primarily driven by lack of garnishments from the PFD. That, that piece needs to be part of the discussion. Maybe it was the budget finance last week for the chair. I'm sorry, I wasn't here for that. But, but that needs to be part of that conversation. And, and so either we schedule a meeting or we get an AIM soon. That, that plan needs to be in place so we understand exactly what we're doing as we build the 2017 budget. Well, and, yeah. The, we will bring you a recommendation regarding the existing fund balance and how it should be deployed or not deployed. Or refunded or whatever. Right, exactly, which would include that. the issue of uh, you know, property tax relief slash refunding. Um, that will be a part of the, uh, we fully expect it to be a part of the budget conversation. It doesn't necessarily require assembly action. Not all of the choices require assembly action but we fully expect to be able to answer your questions regarding the administration's recommendations in those areas. Okay, well, sooner than later. Uh, next week is when we plan to roll out the, the budget overview. So that's the start. Okay. Specificity will be helpful. 
what, we, what this presentation was intended to do was share our understanding of what the structural problems are with the state's failure to act and the state's cost shift. Thank you for my 28 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chen. But just so everybody knows, on September 30th, the week from today, from 1130 to 1230, it's going to be the mayor's presentation budget, and I suspect that that um, the question that Mr. Flynn had regarding the fund balance will be talked about at that work session. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Training. Mr. Abbott, when you're doing this, once the tour is agreed to, would you please have it broken down by community council? Because you know I attend the federation. I want to be able to give the community council, each community council, what the tour looks like for their community council. Sure. Because then we believe when roads don't get plowed, they call us. And it may be a state Last year, the state was looking at shutting all the lights off from Tudor down to Minnesota to save money. If they do that, I want to have the number who they call. I don't want them to pepper us. They need to know who to get a hold of. Her will allow them to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Training. Mr. Moski, do you have any questions? Uh, I'll hold most of my questions. I'll hold actually all of my questions uh, until the actual budget presentation. Well, I think the presentation is over. Are you talking about next the meeting next week, Mr. Foster? Um, I, as they present their budget, that's when I'll formulate my question. And I, I have hard numbers. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bosco. Any other questions from anybody? Seeing none. Thank you.